Oh, good. Um, still missing about this one, one third. Oh, no. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Testing. Yeah. So, so do I need to do something with this one? Is it already? No, 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 it's on, it's on. Is it on? on? Okay, 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 cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Should I start the meeting and get started? Or? Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. Well, we're simply not on terms, but I'm Okay, uh, okay, everyone. I think we're going to get started with our session. Um, we're missing a few people, but uh, we have a number of people online, and of course, some um, all of you are here as well. It is our last day together, but we still have a lot of uh, interesting sessions that we want to share with you today. So we want to make sure we get started. So um, in our first session today, we're going to speak about integration. And I'll let Morton explain a little bit more about the different work that him and his team are performing to support this. I know a lot of you have various integration projects and efforts that you're working on. Um, so uh, I think this will be a very interesting session for you all. Still doing that thing, huh? Still doing that thing. Yeah. So yeah, hello. Oh, okay. it's coming. Yeah. Got to be a bit. Okay. Okay. That's fine. All right. Good morning, everybody. Well, oh, that's too loud. Hello. Testing. Is it good? Sorry. Uh, so I had some, some feedback from before, but have you uh, got your any sound on here? No, no, no. I turned it off. I turned it off. Right now, is this okay? Everyone can hear me. Okay. Now it's going to go. I have to be very close, I guess. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the team. What's called the team integration in Uh A little bit about what we've been doing lately, who we are, and kind of what we keep ourselves occupied with. Um, we have a couple. We have a. One, one guy from our team here called the Chetra. I don't see him right now, but he's somewhere here. And then we also have um, Mort Best from our petrol team that would also do a little bit of session at the end, showing uh, the Open ID Connect um, and how that kind of integrates with CSS2. So, yeah, so can you hear me now? Is it very, I think it's back out again. How close does that to be? Check out that thing. All right. So yeah, no, just a very quick overview of uh, the team itself. Um, we have four people currently working on this. Um, some people are part-time, some people full-time. Uh, me and Bob, we're kind of leading it. Uh, he's the product lead, I'm the technical lead. We're both more or less 50% uh, or, or less on that. Then we have a full-time engineer called Claude uh, from Malta. And we should probably, we'll be meet at some point, hopefully. And then we have Chatra, who are hopefully here with us today. We'll also do a session regarding uh, that control during this non nine minutes. So yeah, um, we, had a, we had a bit of a journey when it comes to the technical stack we've been using. Uh, if you've been following these as two and, and, and integrations for the last like, uh, five to 10 years, um, we've been to using Python, we've been using Node.js, we've been going kind of through many hoops to, to kind of figure out what we should use as our technical stack. Um, we have landed on something now that we feel is, is quite good and it kind of serves our purposes quite nicely. It also aligns with the, the core, um, being that it's Java based. So this is our current uh, stack. Um, it's mainly based on Java, of course. Um, something called Spring Boot, which is basically the Spring framework I kind of put in a, put in a nice package. Uh, Camel, which uh, imp implements what they call the enterprise integration patterns. So they will do all kind of routing of your messages and then, you know, it has probably about 300 plus components of what they call it. So you can listen on uh, topics from Artemis or any kind of pub sub system and then you can react to that and then you can do something like that. You can you know, transform that message into something else, because it's a DSS2, for example. And on top of that, 
um, we have created additions to client SDK. Uh, it's pretty basic at the, at the basic to be honest, but it kind of gives you the, the building blocks of connecting to DHS2, either using basic of or using uh, API tokens. And then you kind of have a, you can easily create that as a bin, as you will see later. Then you can just put that available uh, through the camel. Uh, on top of that SDK, we have the camel component itself. Which again, you will see a little bit of that later. I'm not doing demos today, by the way. I'm trying to keep it a bit less technical than the Tuesday Tuesday um, um, demonstration. Um, on the side here, we have a couple of other technologies uh, that you don't have to use, uh, depending on the situation. You might want to use it, not might want to use it. One is Data Sonnet, uh, which is a JSON to JSON transformation language, which is kind of interesting. And then we have ActiveMQ arguments, which is basically just a pop sub. So you just a queue. You can push messages into and then you can listen it from other places. Um, and all the demos I've been linking to today are all using arguments. So you can see how that works. Um, we also have Hot.io, which I will demonstrate a little bit later. Yeah, so again, the, the Java SDK is meant to be a very simple abstraction. Uh, over an HTTP client, basically giving a little bit of, of uh, HTTP specific uh, methodologies. So um, you have this is the client you can create, so you can do a digital client builder, then you build that with a certain API token, for example, and then you have that ready. Um, same thing to do with, for example, the REST template in Spring and the REST template builder in Spring, and then we can kind of use that. Um, the link is there. Um, we don't usually use this done directly though. Uh, what we actually end up using is, is this one, <coughs> which is the, the camel component. So the camel component is basically our component in camel, the camel ecosystem, to make it easier to get resources, post resources, do updates, do deletions, and all that stuff uh, to um, a unified uh, digital two component. It's still very much in, in work in progress, but it has been used, for example, for our rapid pro integration, it has been used for many, many years already, about a couple years already. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the basic use of it. So it, it has been successfully used in multiple integrations. And again, all the examples I'm linking to, they're all using this component. So this is just a simple example. Um, you can see here, I'm using the SDK to create a new client. Um, I'm kind of putting in the endpoint, the API endpoint. And, 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 and in this case, I'm just using basic authentication. I'm also gonna use API authentication, but yeah, that was this. Now it's just a bean in the Spring ecosystem. I can inject it anywhere. And you will see, you'll do that here. It's like the it's, uh, difference here. Um, you know, try to keep it not too technical, but, but in this case, you're basically listening to your queue. So this is an Artemis queue. So whenever there's something new on that topic you're listening to, um, we will take that, what was on there, which is just a JSON payload. We will put that into a Java class, do a little bit of transformation on that class, and then we will post it to DHS2. And again, the last line here is probably the most interesting. This is a DHS2 component. So in this case, we are posting to metadata endpoints using the resource that we already defined and using the client that we define up here called this as to client target. And I kind of, this is kind of the, the crux of how Camel works. It, you, it allows you to set up this kind of routing and it allows you to set up very, very easily using Java. You can set up this kind of routes. And you can do a lot more complicated stuff than this. Um, you can split. What is up? We can, we can do four loops over it. We can do separate processing, to parallel processing. You can do all this kind of stuff um, if there's something you want. You can also do the conditional um, flows if you want that also, and many, many, many other things. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit of a few of the projects we have been working on, which is uh, call it a product or call it what you want, but it's something that's ready integration, basically. It's something that's ready already. And one of them is the AFI, which is um, adverse effect integration. So this is 
all based on the on metadata package in also the, the WHO AFR package. How many is using that WHO AFR package? Okay, good. So I, 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 know, I, know, I know there's more, but, uh, but yeah, and I'll show you all customize it quite, quite hard a bit. Um, this is also why the integration itself allows you to customize it itself. So, but out of the box, it will give you kind of assuming it's all the Dolce metadata package, but you can rename all the data elements and the attributes and so on to the, whatever you are the, what you do. Right? Um, it does support Medra. So Medra is uh, international standard for coding of reactions. So if you have above 38 fever, or you have a skin rash, they will all have a different code in Medra. Um, so we do support that. That's part of the WHO basic package. You have about, I don't know, 30 or 40 different reactions to vaccines. And uh, we, have, we all have them Medra coded. So they're all coded by Medra. We are still working on a WHO drug. Um, it's taken a bit more time than it should, but hopefully in the next, yeah, maybe January, February, we will have that also working. Um, if you use then the basic vaccination package we have in this uh, too, the, the list of vaccines, um, those should be uh, linked to WHO drug also. Um, but we're still negotiating with WHO UMC about that, just because it's, it's a paid package. So we need to have some negotiations and, and we need to talk about that. Um, again, uh, we have also worked with uh, UMC about API integration. Um, it's taking a bit more time than it should, but we are working with that. So hopefully that also will be working at some point. In general, um, they want us to, to kind of verify the data. So what we have done is to implement uh, basically an email client inside of the integration that every week or every day, if you want, we send you all the new cases that you can it's an XML, you can go through it. You see the XML format here. And then you can verify the information. And you go to Vichy Flow, you just import directly into Vichy Flow and, and then down. And it's done there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just linked a few more. The first one here is just a link to the GitHub for the integration itself, where we have a couple of training material and some uh, use cases. So feel free to look at that later. When it comes to Fire, um, I mean, we've been working with Fire for many years now. Um, we have this adapter that you probably heard about uh, a few years ago, um, which was great in itself. Uh, it didn't really get used by us in any, any case at all. Um, so we kind of take a different, different approach where you're kind of targeting specific parts of Fire. So for example, exchange of code list or option sets, right? So that's something that's very typical that you want to exchange between instances. Uh, or organization units, that's another one. You want to send an organization unit or exchange it between multiple instances of this is true to some fire repository or some fire um, compatible server. Um, and that's just kind of a general approach going forward that you want to do more and more like that. Now we have the entity instance, especially the, the patient. Um, there's a patient profile in uh, fire that you want to kind of support. So this gives you that kind of minimum required for a patient profile. And that's also something we're working on. Um, yeah. And also data value sets for data. Just in the question here. Yeah, so a bit more specifically, um, we have been working with this uh, MCSD standard a little bit. So MCSD is, um, well, it's, it's part of OpenHIE, uh, one of the standards uh, Developed by the uh, application, but basically, um, it's not really ready, uh, both the standard and our integration, but it's kind of serves as an example um, because every every case here probably want to adjust a bit how, how, how they do, do stuff. So, but what they do support um, and what our example do, we are pulling out from these two everything at level one and two. Of course, you can adjust that if you want the whole three. Um, and then we convert that to MCSD variable payload. And you can see that example here. So this is Sierra Leone. And you see it has the system, uh, identifier, ID, and also the call. So you can have multiple uh, identifiers. As, how many of you are using Fire today? In a live system? Not, 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 not in production, not in production, yeah. yeah. 
that's typically what you see in most countries. They're talking about it. So, um, I mean, at the point where you have something that you need help with, we are very happy. We are very happy to help with that. Um, but it's been a lot of non-working systems, basically, or system-to-system -system integration where they want fire, but none, no, none of the systems support fire. Uh, so yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. 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 Sure. 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 But that, that I think OpenSRB supports uh, the fire that already, right? So this should be should be easy. Yeah. Again, I just wanted to show you a screenshot. Of this is the whole bio. Um, this is a very simple UI, but it gives you the full overview of not only what Camel is doing. You can see this is the leads us to the MCSD one I just talked about. Uh, you, can, you can start, you can stop, you can restart. You can look into Spring Boot. You can look into, actually I'm curious if you're using that one. I don't use an Acquit in this case, so it's not showing up. But you can, it kind of gives you a very, very nice UI and you can have a username password for that and you can log in and so on. It kind of gives you a very nice overview. It also allows you to, to if it's a very particular busy, if you have like sort of a timer every five minutes and it's a particularly busy day, time of day, you can kind of stop it. Then you can wait a few hours and you can restart the end later. Yeah, so again, this is another of these OpenSIE standards called SVCM. Um, so this is all about, the standard itself is all about sharing of value sets and, 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 and code systems. Um, but what that basically means in our domain is option sets and options. But that's, that's what it maps to. Um, so we've done a little bit different here. Um, we have a few different integrations. It's just one of them. Um, but this one is actually creating what's called an implementation guide using what's called FISH. Which FISH is a language for, it's an abstraction over the, the, the very old language that's used to define implementation guides. And you can see there, it's very, very simple markup language. You can see what you have here. You find a call system, this is the ID, uh, the title, description, and so on, the URL. Then you just define all your, your categories or your dimensions, and you will see it shows up here. And, and, that, kind of, and, and that also gives you a full guide, basically. Um, let's see, can see how it up. Let's see. Yeah, so, so I, I have it here. So this is just the, uh, oh. this is all from uh, this year, the one that is, it's a bit, it's a bit like, like this, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, we can do it like, um, it's an interesting one. Um, type of population, right? So you have migrant population, refugee, every worker. And this one is something that somebody on the fire receiving side will understand. Uh, but it's all coming from, from DHS2. Uh, one thing to mention is that, as you probably understand here, we're not using code. We actually use just the UID from DHS2. And that is because our codes in DHS2, you have to be a little bit careful there because our codes in DHS2 can support spaces and all kinds of characters, and even emojis, I think, and all kinds of strange stuff. Um, fire does not. So when you're designing your code for integration, you have to be a little bit more reserved and you have to be a little bit more careful. So, and, and it basically follows the rules of a UID. So don't, don't, don't start with a number, don't have spaces and so on. Um, yeah. I don't know, how many people here are actually designing their own codes when they design like a data element? Do you also put something in the code field? Or you just leave it blank. Yeah. So it's a standard for that. Like we stand, yeah, standardize it. Yeah. So all this, all this stuff is going to help you build integrations later if you kind of follow along a certain guidelines for that. Even though this has to allow you to do a lot, it doesn't mean you should necessarily follow follow it. You should have some restrictions on on that. Yeah, so this, this is just more, more examples. Okay. So 
these are just some links to more examples. Um, there's something from the, the digital annual conference we had in the summer. The his base one is all from this one. Um, we also show off this event group demo that we did uh, the other day. Um, then we also have a new flashy website, um, which I will show very quickly. Um, this is probably going to be your non stop first place to ever go if you want to do anything five with just two. Uh, Yeah. So you see, um, it has a lot of information about the file in general, what it is, but also how it relates to Disha 2. So if you go down a little bit on page, you'll see um, Disha 2 on fire. And if you can explain our, the way we can approach fire and how that works. Um, I'm sorry, it's a bit late. <laughs> sorry, it's, it's coming soon. <laughs> it is coming. Yeah. So, because, so the case, look at that page. If you're interested in fire in general, please have a look at that page. And then, if you have any questions regarding it, uh, there's a community practice and there's also integration at the institute.org, which can just send an email to us if you have any, any, any use cases. Or just email me directly, it's also fine. Um, and all, all the way down, there will be links to a bunch of examples uh, of, of fire. Um, it's basically what, what I linked to already, but um, coming, going forward, there will be a lot more examples here that you can look into. So every time we make a new example or even a product, we are on fire, they will be put on this page. Every time we make the slide deck or anything like that, it will be put on this page. So just very quickly about something that's very relevant to um, integration itself. That's not really part of the integration team, but I'm also working on the platform team. And this is something I've been working on for a while now. Um, it's called Event Hooks. So we currently have <clears throat> in this S2, uh, we have something called the audit log. Um, into the audit log goes most updates, if you have enabled it. And it is possible to externalize that and listen to that, but it was never meant to be um, kind of a hook itself. It was just meant to store audits, basically. That was the whole point of it. Um, so in 240, we're making a fully fledged event hook system. Um, where we, in this case, as you see, we're creating a web hook, but we will be supporting multiple clients, multiple receivers. So web hook is one, Kafka will be one. FMQ will be one, and so on, so on, so on. Um, and if you have a specific need, you can tell us, but we, we can add multiple recipients um, to that one, quite, 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 quite easily, actually. And, and again, this format is not ready, but you see in this case, I'm just listening to metadata, which means give me everything related to metadata. I don't care if it's great, update, delete, I don't care. I just want everything related to metadata. And if you go down here, this is the client. So, in this case, you just received a create notice. Here you could potentially take that payload, send it to your MFL, or send it to your other systems, and you do an update there. Um, in this case, we're just putting it out, but that's just an example. And as you see, what I'm listening to the path metadata, the actual path is metadata dot organization unit dot the ID of the organization unit. Yeah, so, it's a, so I could potentially here, Listen to changes of a single organism if that's what I wanted. Yeah, it could be very specific. And we will also allow field filtering on that later on. So you don't, in this case, you get the full payload, but you can actually be very specific. I want to just want the ID, for example, I just want the ID and call, for example. That you can, that, that, that you'll be able to do very, very soon. Um, and again, yeah, so metadata is the target for 240. Um, if time allows, you might be adding some data. Maybe the scheduler, scheduler started, scheduler finished. Um, this can be very, very important in certain cases. For example, if you want to have a script that does something when the analytics is done, that you should be able to do it in 240. So you just listen to that notice saying analytics run is done, and then, then you can start your other process. Right? Then, then you can start pulling up data from DCS2 because analytics has, has been has finished running um, everything. So just the one last slide before I hand it over to Shatra. Um, 
talked a little bit about this already, but kind of the, the main way we see forward um, is that we will shift a little bit the focus, not we will still focus on integration with other systems, but we need to be a lot better on the integration with ourselves. Because more and more now we see these just three instances more in, a, in one country, more might have three, four, five, six instances of this as two, and we need to keep them in sync somehow. And that's getting, well, it's getting more and more tricky, to be honest. So that's something we'll be working on. We'll be starting with organics. So there will be an organic, well, there's a little sync product that will support organics, and then maybe option sets, then maybe data sets and data elements, and then we can go from there, and depending on what people want. So you can keep all of this stuff in sync. Um, maybe on the way we will clean some things up and we, we yeah, make it a bit nicer. Um, again, fire is something that's important for us. If you have a use case, we are very ready to listen. Very important to know that we are not anti fire just because we don't have too much fire products. We are very much into fire. We are very happy to support that. Uh, so, if you have a system in your country, a real fire system that you need. Integration with, we are very happy to support with that. Um, yeah, as I said, promote existing fire integrations on the website. So we will continue building the, the SDK, continue building the common component. We will at some point probably add some fire layer to that. Maybe we have like, uh, our own custom fire component um, that will help you to do that, that transformation. But of course, fire is itself is as generic as we just do. So, for example, a patient can be nothing, no, no name, no date of birth, nothing. That is a valid patient. So, fire itself also requires a profile. So, that's, that's a little bit important. People don't always understand that. So it's a little bit important to mention. Fire itself needs to be profiled or configured um, before you can have that integration happening. Uh, again, uh, I think we will, this is actually very important. So, then we will continue working with the platform team to add accessibility to DHS2. We are starting with the event hooks, as I just showed you. It's again, it's extremely important. That's going to be a game changer, I think. But we also will be doing um, API gateways, maybe, maybe 240, but probably 241. And API gateway is basically a way of you defining your own endpoint to design DHS2. But when you post to get from that endpoint, it will go to the server and fetch some data. And then with that, you can securely define the, uh, the tokens to access it. The, the basis code, you can do that, all this kind of thing. It will be encrypted inside of this as too. So the client doesn't see any of this stuff. It just goes to the endpoint of this as too. Your custom app, for example, you just go to the endpoint and it will be pulling somewhere else. This is, of course, extremely important if you're doing something like MPI, you're able to pull in a patient from a different system, for example. Um, it's a very, very typical use case. Um, we also recommend them to um, update how we look at identifiers. As you all know, we have this uh, code field, right? Everything they have is a code, but you don't know the context of that code. You just know it's a code, and you might have multiple systems want to have different codes. So that's something we're also looking into supporting. So you can have specific codes for the specific systems. So that's uh, that's also good. It's coming, I'm not going to promise that the timeline for that, but it's coming later. Yeah, maybe 241 or something. Um, yeah, and also code lists. So we have option sets, uh, but option sets are not very really usable. Um, in Fire, for example, you can create different, what they call the code systems. Then you have what's called a value set, which is what you actually use. And you can pull out codes, filtered list of codes from these systems. Then you have a value set. This is exactly what you care about. Um, we, we not, we, we're not going to take that model directly, but we are looking into how we can optimize how we do code lists in general. And maybe the bigger announcement, there will be an integration academy coming up in March in Rwanda. Uh, the dates are TBA, but they will be announced how we usually announce all these the academies. So that, that's coming up. Um, sometime mid late March, it probably is that. Um, that uh, I hope to see some of you there. Uh, that would be a full week. Um, so we have much more time to go, get to go into the details of the SDK, the camera component, everything. So we have much, much more time. And uh, that's my part. So the next part is uh, Chatra. 
Um, are there any questions for me before I uh, jump to the software? So he will go through the rapid pro integration we'll be doing. Then we, after that, we will have the open ID uh, integration. All right. In Shatra, you can. Uh... Uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, my name is Chatur, and uh, I'm going to walk you through one of the latest integration that we have done on the toolings uh, that Morton just mentioned, especially uh, the uh, camera component for DHS2. And uh, before moving to the slides, I would like to uh, mention my friend Claude, who is kind of doing most of the heavy lifting of this integration. So, he's not with us today. Uh, hopefully, he's joining online. Uh, so, so uh, the DHS2 Rapid Pro integration, I mean, the structure of it is uh, similar to most of the integrations uh, that we have to do nowadays. So, we have two or more independently running systems, and they kind of know uh, one or more types of uh, transfer protocols. So, in this case, uh, Rapid Pro knows uh, HTTP and DHS2 knows. HTTP, and they kind of knows how to communicate uh, with the known uh, payload format, which is JSON in this case. Um, so when uh, integrating Rapid Pro and DHIS2, we have to kind of develop a uh, middleware, which kind of communicates with both these systems back and forth, and exchange these JSON payloads. Uh, I mean, I mean it, it, it gets the JSON payload from one of the systems and transfer that to a JSON structure, which is known by the other system, and then simply send that to the uh, whatever the transfer protocol uh, supported by the second system. So the communication happens uh, in both directions. In this case, I will, uh, I mean, which I will explain in the next set of slides. And uh, when developing this middleware, we have used uh, Camel, obviously, uh, which is kind of uh, based on the uh, DHS2 camera components. And in addition to that, we are using Data Sonar, which is a scripting language uh, which can be used to transfer uh, transform one payload from uh, a payload from one format to another. So in this case, Data Sonar support uh, JSON, XML, CSV, and it even supports uh, Java objects. So I mean, if there's a Java object that you want to convert uh, into XML or JSON, that is also supported in data so so Java object you can uh, maybe you will be getting that from uh, serialized data or it can it could be RPC four so whatever it is data so is capable of transferring that from one format to another and uh, this integration is by the way available on GitHub on this uh, link if you want to uh, try it out um, so let me introduce you to Graphics Pro so I hope most of you have seen on television. Uh, uh, especially when it comes to reality TV programs, where they kind of ask you to vote for the participants. Um, so the, I mean, what they mainly say is uh, you have to uh, type some kind of a code, space, and then the participants' uh, ID, and then send that message to uh, whatever the uh, number that they mention. So that is kind of uh, the most basic uh, thing that we can implement on Rapid Pro. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's kind of like a uh, messaging workflow that can be designed through the UI itself. And it can, uh, I mean, starting from the use case that I just mentioned, it can go up to more complex uh, message flows, which involves uh, tens of hundreds of questions, maybe. Um, so, for instance, uh, uh, if I, I'm not sure whether it's visible. Uh, so, so if I take this message here, it asks for, uh, did you have any sickness in your cluster? So then uh, what it does is, uh, once this flow has been uh, initialized by one of the users by sending that uh, code, which is specific to this particular uh, Rapid Pro flow, then it's going to send this SMS back to the user, and then user gets the ability to send yes, no, or something else. So, uh, in this case, if the user uh, responds with yes, then it's going to continue with this flow and ask the ne next question. 
And if uh, the user responds with a response with no, then it's going to just set congratulations and that's going to end the flow. So that's kind of how you could uh, be message, messaging workflows on RabbitRoot. And what RabbitRoot does is, while, uh, while the user is going through all these messages hierarchy, it's going to capture the responses from the user and ultimately create one large payload, which includes all the responses from the user. And then we can configure RabbitRo either to send that as a webhook message to an external system, or uh, RabbitRo by default saves all those responses uh, into the database. Um, so yeah, so let me go through the functional requirements of this integration. So the first uh, uh, and the mandatory requirement uh, of this integration is synchronizing DHS to users and rapid pro contact. So DHS has this concept for concept of users, while rapid pro has the concept of contacts. So in order to receive uh, a message successfully into rapid pro, we need to have a contact predefined. So it is associated with some kind of a mobile number. Uh, and by the way, rapid pro also supports other communication uh, platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp, but in this case, we are only interested in um, SMSs. Um, so we, we need to have a valid contact in RabbitPro with a valid phone number. Uh, so in, uh, for that, we kind of, I mean, the, uh, the middleware kind of holds DHIS2 for users with valid phone numbers, and then it populates uh, RabbitPro with a copy of DHIS2 users. Um, so this is mainly done uh, to identify the organization units of DHS2 users because we can associate the DH, associate the DHS2 users into uh, organization units, and uh, the I, I mean the ultimate idea of this rapid pro integration is taking aggregated events from the users in the form of SMSs and then populating them back to DHS2 as data value sets. So as you know, when uh, when we are sending a data value set, we need to include uh, the organization units. So this is how we capture that capture that requirement. So we take the users with valid phone numbers, and also we capture the organization unit where that user belongs to, and then we save that uh, user into RabbitPro as a RabbitPro contact. And as an additional parameter, we save the DHIS to organization unit into the uh, into that contact. And the next requirement is broadcasting reminders. Uh, so this is done when uh, a data value set is kind of like uh, overviewed. So uh, the middleware component periodically calls for overviewed uh, data value sets and then uh, sends a message as a reminder, SMS as a reminder to all the rapid pro contacts so that uh, they will be reminded about uh, entering data. And the uh, most uh, important and the core requirement, core functional requirement is transferring aggregated data or transferring reports as I mentioned. Um, so um, uh, as I previously mentioned when explaining the, uh, 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 how, explaining how RapidPro works, uh, we have two options here. When a flow is completed in RapidPro, we can configure RapidPro to uh, immediately call a webhook and notify about the uh, new event. Or uh, we can, I mean, from, uh, from our middleware, we can even call RabbitPro periodically by specifying the flow ID to get, uh, get uh, new events which are available on RabbitPro end. Uh, so we have, I mean, the middleware has been implemented uh, to support uh, both these uh, approaches. So you can start the middleware uh, by configuring uh, it to work with any of these modes. So what happens here is when I use the sense and SMS, Rapid Pro is going to uh, walk the user through that uh, messaging flow. And if it uh, if the flow is successful, and if the middleware is configured and the Rapid Pro uh, flow is configured to uh, notify the middleware through a webhook, Rapid Pro is going to immediately send her uh, webhook call to the middleware. And at that point, it's going to go through the camel routes and data sort of transformations to convert um, uh, the new event into the data value sets payload. And at the same time, uh, since we have to plug in the organization unit into the data value set, 
the middleware is going to call the rapid pro back with the user ID or the contact ID and get the organization ID and plug that into the uh, data value search payload and finally call DHIS2 to, to persist that into the DHIS2 database. So the same applies for uh, polling method. Instead of rapid pro immediately calling for an incoming event, um, middleware is going to periodically call rapid pro and take all the new events and do the same procedure iteratively. And uh, while uh, doing this uh, integration, we have identified some non functional requirements. Uh, some of them are common for any of the integrations, like we need to be reliable. So that means if, if we capture an event on Rapid Pro and if a flow is successfully completed, uh, whatever we have captured should uh, reliably land on the DHIS2 database. So that is one of the things that we should guarantee. Uh, I mean, when it comes to webhooks, it's kind of a little bit hard to do that to uh, I mean, guarantee this uh, reliability. So that's why we have introduced a polling uh, method. So if something is failed, it can pre poll uh, for the same events. And the other uh, common, re common non-functional requirements are security and maintainability, which are like, common for any, any other uh, integration. And the one of the most important uh, non-functional requirement is it should be fast enough because uh, so now we have uh, considered only a simple example where one user is sending messages to Rapid Pro, but there uh, I mean there can be scenarios where hundreds of thousands of users sending messages at the same time. So the middleware component should be fast fast enough to uh, deliver those messages from source to destination with an acceptable throughput and a low latency. And also uh, these uh, integrations should, should be extensible enough so, th uh, so that we can uh, add more components or more, more features. For instance, uh, this uh, entire integration has been successfully deployed in Uganda and is, it's in production, but the requirement was a little bit different. So instead of transferring directly from Rapid Pro to DHIS2, they, they have some uh, homegrown solution called MTrack Pro. So the integration, I mean, if you consider the high level overview of the integration, it's an integration from Rapid Pro. Uh, then we have the middleware, and then they have that MTrack Pro, which, is, which they kind of use mostly for ODD. And then uh, MTrack Pro publishes messages uh, from, uh, uh, from its database to the DHIS2. So, um, so in order to uh, facilitate such requirements, uh, the entire integration solution should be extensible enough. And other than the functional and non-functional uh, adhering to the non-functional uh, functional and non-functional requirements, we have provided uh, tools for management, monitoring, and recovery. And I think uh, Morton already explained uh, what how IO is capable of. Um, so we kind of like uh, provide inbuilt support for how IO, uh, which is capable of stopping and pausing routes, so which is really important. Uh, if the downstream system is uh, under maintenance or something. So let's say the HIS2 system is offline for maintenance. So then you can simply log into Hub.io from the browser itself and stop uh, all the camel routes uh, which uh, carries data from Rapid Pro to DHIS2, which is uh, really helpful. So you don't have to log into the server and uh, stop the middleware manually. You can simply do uh, everything on the browser itself. And also it supports uh, supports uh, uh, building logs and it shows, uh, I mean, if there's a failure in the route, it uh, simply shows how many failures were there and what was the cause for the failure. And also you can analyze uh, latency of the route. So if, if one route is taking like minutes to complete, you can simply log in and identify uh, what route is taking so much time and you can uh, take necessary steps to prevent that. And the other tool that we provide is H2. Uh, so we have a H2 database which writes to the disk um, and we use H2 as the data letter channel. So if a message, if there's a message failure, we simply write that message back to H2. So you can later uh, log in to H2 and inspect what's going on 
And if you figure it out, you can simply manually replay that message. So you don't uh, lose any messages. And H2 also saves uh, success logs and failure logs and everything. Uh, basically, whatever the logs that's been produced in the uh, rapid crawl crowd will be saved to H2. So uh, it's easy to analyze and can be used for auditing purposes because it's recording all the, uh, I mean, the DHS2 contact from the, sorry, the rapid crawl contact who sent the message and uh, along with the payload that he said. Yeah, so that's all about uh, rapid pro integration. Uh, so over to you, Modmus. Oh, and any questions? No questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, there's a YouTube video for that. So if you search for DHS to rapid pro, there's a full end to end demo of that. Thanks. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is also Morton. Uh, you can call me Morton Senior. I'm one year older than older Morton. Or you can call me Morton Security because I'm also working with security. Or you can call me just Morton Swans with this my surname. So, yeah, I'm a. There you go. So, yeah, I'm a Java backend developer. Uh, I worked as a contractor for the University of Oslo. I started in 2019. So I worked on the platform backend team together with Morten, Lars, and here now. And I also worked on the security team with uh, Bob, which you might know, and Michael, and Austin, and Jamie, and Phil. So, so my background from I'm a, uh, computer security is mostly from bank and finance. Um, I also was running on Norway's biggest backup company for several years. Uh, yeah, also a tiny bit the computer the security experience from the military when I was very young. Uh, yeah, so one of the first things we learn there is like if you if you if you plug the computer confidential information into the into the wall, you will lose your job like the same day. So it's very inconvenient to have to take out the information with the hard drive and it's in a, in a suitcase and go strap uh, to your hand and go. It's uh, very inconvenient, but it's very secure. So that's kind of computer security is very much about this kind of convenience versus yeah, practical. So yeah. So this is my first time to his. Uh, I've been only invited by uh, by Morten here. I because I live uh, per, I've been living in Philippines now for four years. So, yeah, so I'm pretty close by in the HR region. So, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'm, um, yeah, plus eight time zones. So, yeah, yeah um, it's been, this week been very inspiring. It's very nice to see people actually using all this uh, stuff instead of just sitting in my home office and working on. So, it's been very inspiring and very grateful to be invited. Meet you all guys. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, OpenID Connect and what it is and what we can do with that. So, yeah, OpenID Connect is a it's an industry standard protocol for authentication and identity. So it provides what you probably heard like does work for like single sign-on. Yeah. And so. So what it basically does is like it take, takes away the need to manage like password and identity uh, for the for, for like multiple instances. If you have like a lot of instances, you have the same users. You can have them in like one central place instead of like on each instance, and you have to deal with that. So, so this is typically about this. Uh, but we're going to talk about the Libison uh, with this uh, key console. So this uh, is very often used in countries and organizations that already have an uh, existing like, uh, identity, uh, identification system infrastructure. For example, in Norway, the government works together with uh, the banks to maintain uh, 
OpenAdic connect server authentication service for also for commercial uh, actors that wants to have uh, security reliable uh, identification authentication. And we also the innovation healthcare system also has their own OpenAdic connect uh, compatible authentication service uh, called HealthSeed. This is the one they're actually using for their uh, uh, these ISSS um, instances. So actually, the Norwegian healthcare system, when they implemented the, the COVID tracker system, they were the first to actually start using up and connect uh, in the platform. So yeah. so yeah, you've probably seen it when you log in with Google, log in with Facebook, etc. Oh, this is the same technology, same uh, thing. So it's a very common technology. It's been supported since 235. Yeah, as I said, and it's used by big, uh, several big implementations. So, but yeah, of course, there's also some challenges to using OpenAdic uh, Connect and a central authentication system. It's, um, primarily that is role management and authorization because, yeah, uh, the HSS has a very complicated uh, role system. Uh, it, can, it can be very complicated. Um, OpenAdic Connect doesn't really support like authorization, it's so many identity and authentication uh, system. So for, for all the big implementations, they have made their own custom solutions to, to manage and synchronize and deal with this. So the, it's very much custom solutions to handle this. So yeah. And also synchronizing users between instances is also necessary when because you have to maintain the roles and authorization uh, also annually. And also session synchronization between instances is a uh, challenge. Oh, yeah. yeah, so what we have been trying to do uh, for a while now is to set up a, an OpenID Connect server called Keyclock, which is a 100% open source uh, OpenID Connect server, and it's very uh, Non enterprise, it has uh, yeah, Red Hat is currently maintaining it. Uh, they also have a supported uh, version. Uh, it's been around since 2014, it's very mature. And it's very easy to set up, uh, very modern user interface, and it's very uh, easy to configure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not going to show you a demo of it today. Uh, we did that on Tuesday. Uh, it's very, very simple uh, setup. Yeah, I don't think we got to do that. Uh, that but you can typically do this in a couple of hours to just set it up and get started. So if you want to run your own uh, OpenID Connect service, uh, Keyclock is a, a second alternative. So yeah, this is basically just very simple. What you're going to see when you're having an OpenID Connect login, you see this sign in the Keyclock. This can be anything you can see is signing up with everyone. Uh, then you, instead of logging in with a username and password on the front page on the left, left side there, you're going to be redirected to the key clock login page. And when you sign in there, then you're going to be redirected back to, to the yeah, HSS server. Yeah. So if you want to read more about this and see how other people are using it, uh, yeah, there's some links for you. Look at this. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Yeah, if, if you have any questions, just feel free to, to email me or, yeah, yeah, go on. Well, if it supports the OpenID Connect protocol, you can start using it. Just configure the instance and um, you're ready to go, more or less. Yeah, it has to support OpenID Connect. Uh,
Okay. Well, as I said, feel free to email me, reach out if you have any questions about this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So thanks everyone. Um, that's the end of our conversation today. Um, I just want to say we did have a talk exactly about this on Tuesday. Uh, that's quite a bit more technical. It has examples of the SDK usage, example of the common component usage, and so on as demos. So if you just go to YouTube. And you can just search for this as two. Um, you should be able to find that quite easily. I think it's called, um, yeah, this one. No, no, I'm not going to show it now, obviously, but uh, uh, if you just go to, uh, go to this as your channel, uh, you'll find the 90 minute talk we have there, and there will be actual demos of. All the stuff we did, including real time demos of the event hook, of the rapid pro stuff, not sorry, not the rapid pro, but the, of the, the camel integrations and so on. Uh, so feel free to look at our channel. And Sir Grant will be very happy to do that. Uh, we are trying to put all the content we are doing all this week and there. And this is a less technical one, so we are a bit short on time, which is fine. Uh, but, they will, but please feel free to go to that one if you're interested in Java coding and those kind of things. Uh, we have more real demos there um, showing the actual things in, in functioning, including um, Audacious 2, the key clock integration that we've been working on. Where we basically transfer um, all the OpenID Connect users from one instance into Kicklock. So, yeah, so feel free, feel free to do that. Other than that, I think we are okay. Uh, are there any last questions for us for the integration team as a whole? Or any what fire or anything we've been working on, any kind of issues we have been having? Yeah, this kind of it's okay. <laughs> All right, then I think we are okay for now. So feel free to again um, contact us here. Um, we are very open, very there's, uh, there's no barrier of entry. If you have any kind of integration question, please just send it to us. We will get back to you. We don't have a 24 hour response time as the security team, but we will get back to you. And uh, we also have every Friday, uh, we have this weekly community call uh, where if you're interested in, in uh, integrations in general, feel free to join those. And if you want to be added to that list, um, again, just send it here, send a request here. I will add it to that list uh, for the calendar invite. Um, the timing is not probably the best. Um, it's about 5 p.m. here. Now, uh, uh, yeah, 5 p.m. here now in uh, Asia. So that's um, six. Well, that's uh, 11 in Norway and 10 in Ireland. If Bob Jolly is coming from, so yeah, it depends on what you want. But but again, if you want to be part of those weekly community calls, feel free. We have a lot of his people there from Africa, uh, sometimes from Asia. But it's very open. If you want to join, just just test all okay. And uh, that's the last for me. If, honestly, any last questions? I'm, uh, I will finish the. Uh, oh. yeah. Right, that's it. Is there any questions from the people online? Uh, thank you. Oh. Yeah. All right. Okay, again, thanks a lot. Have a good day. <laughs> relax, relax. Wait, wait. Let's have more questions. There's more questions. I don't know. I'm just checking from here. Some people are, was it too complicated? <laughs> no, we're not live anymore, so now you can be more freely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no. As again, I showed you the email address. I mean, feel free, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, feel free to just send emails there. And brother, you know, you know my email address, so if you can send me directly or so. Um, 
every integration case is also going to be different. It's also going to require a different approach to it. And, you know, in, in the Cambodia, there was a lot of stuff happening and it was a complicated integration, but we made it work. And then it's going to be another different country, it's going to be different uh, conditions, and that's going to be complicated probably also. So um, there's very, very rarely a one size fits all when it comes to integration. It's all have to be customized uh, locally. So this is very, very common. Yeah. So is the OpenID connected useful? Or don't want it. As a, as, as Morton said, and, and, and it is very useful, but it's useful for certain use cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have one DHS2, you probably don't need it. But so, so part of the issue with OpenID Connect is that they still have to synchronize the users in DHS2, and then you use OpenID Connect as the authentication, basically. So whenever somebody calls you, oh, I forgot my password, you don't have to go into three different instances on the change password, change password, change password. You have one unified place to do that. And actually, the password isn't even stored in those places anymore. They just have the OpenID Connect link, that's all. Which is great because this just doesn't expose your password when you do an export of the user. So if you're doing a user synchronization from one place to another place, you cannot bring along the password. So you, it makes it easy to synchronize users on multiple places, but you have OpenID Connect or KeyClock in this case to store the password and then it will work for every single instance. But of course, you can still configure your user to be different, different access rights in every, every, user, every instance, yeah, which is very important. Because it might be tracker, it might be HMIS, it might be something else, the COVID and so on. And you don't want the same user to have access to the same things in every instance. So that's still up to you, that's still up to you. This is more only about authentication of the password probably. Okay. Yeah. And how many people here, just to show hands, are uh, using Rapid Pro? <laughs> any, any country in Asia using Rapid Pro? So uh, for the open ID, you should probably Support these guys, and you just have to put the. I'm, I'm trying now. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, opening up again. The contact is very personal, or like even in the digital.org, do we have any? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's only to share my screen. Sorry. Like these are the people we need to contact for the open ID company. Because we know we have the. the yeah, so again, um, yeah, yeah. sometimes it kind of depends on the question if it's a little bit more sensitive or not, depending on if you have to give some credentials and so on. But in general, starting with the community practice is probably a good idea. Um, Which will have a second, uh, the, the, yeah, the future of how we can practice. 
If you search for CMP DHS2, this is the first link that you will go to. So here you can uh, create your own user account. And there's a lot of topics here that you can go to. Um, and we even have a special place for integrations. So um, but feel free to post it anywhere if it makes sense. But uh, yeah, there might be, I think there's already some uploading questions here actually. Just to open ID. See, there's all the people asking. Yeah, yes, sir. So, so there's support. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually so old, so this is OpenID. Yeah. So don't confuse OpenID with uh, OpenID Connect. Uh, that's the older protocol. So make sure that your system supports OpenID Connect. And uh, if you haven't been using OAuth in this too, OpenID and uh, OAuth is basically merged together into OpenID Connect. That's basically what happened. This is very simple simplification, but uh, unless what's happened. So OpenID Connect is the new one. Um, so yeah. Feel free to 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 write here, and uh, Martin's very happy to 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 go there and, uh, and reply. I know, I know. There was a kickbox question. Uh, anyways, the the point is, this is a good place to go if you have any kind of issues to questions in general, uh, but also for integration, also for um, yeah, stuff like the key clock stuff. Um, this is kind of your go-to place for those kind of questions. Um, and um, I hope you all have an account because this should be your starting point whenever you have an issue. Even before you create a Jira issue, and you always say create a Jira issue, but feel free to start in the COP. The very, very nice guy called Dustin is watching over most of these posts. And whenever we don't reply, because we are lazy, and uh, he will tell us, please, 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 can you reply to this one? And then he will remind us. Yeah. So, so feel free to do that. Um, and, and I think it's the best, probably the best place to say. It. I mean, feel free to even more know so that you know that might be maybe seasonal holiday. So, but uh, that doesn't always work. So, yeah. 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 So, it comes to security, there's a couple of things. General security, you can ask on the COP. If something you think is a bug or something that's critical, uh, you can send that to security at dhs2.org. Um, that's kind of the, the, the place for that. Again, any more questions about any of the common stuff or any of the things we'll be doing, feel free. Uh, and again, feel free to come up to us later. We will, we will be here. Or email or community practice. So, what was what is camel? Who knows what camel is? <laughs> <laughs> I know a horse. <laughs> a horse. I don't see any camel. <laughs> this is not the kind of camel you can get camel meat from. This is a different kind of camel. Huh? Apache camel. Yeah. <laughs> so, I can explain it again. I, and it's basically. But how we do the integration, uh, how we do this integration framework, um, which implements the integration patterns that we have been using. We go all the way back to the slides I had before. And again, I try to do this non-technical, so I'm not going into much detail, but camera specifically what allows us to Now, especially what allows us to do this from stuff. It allows us to set out smaller route. So it allows us to do all kinds of things using predefined components of the common subsystem. That just makes it a lot easier for us to write code. So um, in, in the links that I've been sharing, um, if you go to the, this one, sorry, this is great. Go to the HISP Asia 1A 2022. 
there will be examples of doing organic sync, key club sync, uh, and a few other kind of examples. And the one above it has, again, using Camel, using data sonnet, as uh, Shasha was talking about, and, and how to, to do that. So please look at the examples, try it yourself if you want to do that, and see what you can do. Uh, as we go forward in the integration team in general, we will try to be creating more and more products. So that means, for example, a ready-made, something like AFI that we are making, that's kind of a product that's ready to be implemented. You have the Rapid Pro, so the product that's been ready to be implemented, but it's all based on what I showed you today. It's all based on the SDK, it's all based on the camera side. Um, so we'll be providing products, but we'll also be providing the, the underlying layer so you can build it yourself. As I said, every use case for integration will be different, so it's a very, very common thing to do local customizations. Let's say like, we know in our health system, it's fragmented, right? It's a vertical system. We have many things, and when we, most of the time, we are integrating with others. Right? How do we integrate it? We have the technical people, and then like, they do the script, uh, mapping this one, and pushing the data, and all things. That's, that has been the approach before. There is a no standard way of doing the integration. So, yeah, they have seen in uh, Indonesia when Martin was there, so every different system, it was a different script for some reason. Long time back, bad script or like a high bound script or other things where you want to integrate. So now they are trying to standardize so that like any country wants to like integrate, you start from there. You see, okay, I want to integrate in this particular place, in this, uh, this organ only, or with the data or with things. So see what is available rather than starting coding. Please don't tell your technical people, okay, I want to integrate with technical people. I don't want to look. I know how to code. So they create their own development every time. But that has been our biggest challenge, uh, especially dealing with the developers. <laughs> so always tell them to please have a look. See all things are make use of this thing. So Mountain and this team are going to create many tools so they can try to actually use that. And then your development time will be ready to start. What is useful for us is okay, you have this tool. So instead of starting from scratch, it could take 100 mandates. So now it can be like 20 mandates. So it's also linked to our budget. So make sure that like let's say have a look at from here. And then it would also good to explain or write a email to the team so that like they know, okay, like we have a focus on here. Let them spend their time in creating this generic tool, at least a simple generic tool, so that like, we, we can reduce the time of our developers and our people to you know, not spend on that one, like spend on something. That was the, the whole idea behind uh, this thing. Seeing that you have a little bit of time, I'm just going to show you one of the demos that's available on the slide, on the, slide, on the link, link from the slide. Um, very typical use case, you have one or many different test instances. Maybe you have what we call the master, the master facility list, or you have just the kind of main source of your organets. Uh, I started up the integration here, which is available as the, in, the, in the demo, in the, in the GitHub repository. I'm not going to go through the code anything like that. I just know, I just will tell you that it's running now. Um, these are, they, they might look the same, sorry, it's a bit late. But it's actually demo one and demo two. So there's two different instances of conditions too. And I have configured the source here to be demo one and the target could be demo two. Of course, in this, you could also have multiple targets, but in this case, the target is demo one and two. Um, just, just, an, just as an example of what a typical camera can do, you can just go here, create a new one, call it for Coke. Except the opening dates, maybe open today. And then, wait a bit. I don't remember the timing now. Yeah, I'll say. And oh, oh shit, I made a spelling mistake. It should be Foucault ABC. Right? So I just go back here, save it. This is my source. Go now to the target. I set it to 10 seconds, I think, in this case. You can also set a much more shorter time if you want. You see, now it's been updated. 
for two completely different instances of the two, but a very typical integration case where you're kind of keeping things in sync. There are a lot more to it than that. This is just a simple example, but we will be making products, integration products available that will help you with this kind of thing. Help you keeping organisms sync across multiple instances, giving some parameters, maybe oh, only this group, or this group in this case, and, and so on. And same with option sets, the same with all the kind of the building blocks of these as two, you will be, be doing that. And that's something we will focus on for the next six to, to one year, maybe the next years actually. And, and while we are expanding our SDK, expanding our common components. Any kind of integration, please write an email or describe okay, from this particular system. I'm going to want to Right now, the, all the integration process, what happens is it comes from the big donors. They integrate between Rapid Pro, integrate Firefly. Like, at the country level, it's completely different. So, like, we are not getting any country use cases. So, we are, we are just like giving the use from the global level. Okay, we might need to get what we use it. So please write uh, the email and the thing so that it's probably what you want to write in the right? and let them handle So since we have five more minutes, I can also show you the live uh, kickoff demonstration. So what is required to get kickoff working? And um, this is kind of what kind of gets people a bit confused sometimes. Um, What is required to have Kiklet working across multiple instances is that you have the same user, same username, same Kiklet ID in, this, in the multiple instances. So in this case, we have selected a user just for test user. You click on that one, you'll see he has the email address, he has a name and so on, um, any thing. Um, external authentication only. And the uh, mapping value is test at user or that's actually not that important. You can use the username also. Um, but when I click on external only, the password field is re removed. So this user does, does not have any password to it. And in demo four, if you look at the, okay, this is demo four, you will see the same user again. This you can synchronize in many ways, also with camera if you want, or any kind of way, but we have to synchronize this. What's really important here is again, you have the, the, the mapping value, external auth only, and the username. Those things are really important. You can have different, different names and so on. Doesn't really matter, but you have to have the key components must be the same. And what does this allow you to do? Well, I will log out here. I will log out here. So now we are logged out on both instances. And go back to my user here. You'll see, I have test user here, test at user org, same, exactly the same user as I had in this as two. So now the password is controlled by Kiklog. So I can reveal potentials, I can kind of reset the password. Let's do something uh, really secure, ABC123. Copy it. I reset the password for that user. But it doesn't affect this too because it doesn't care. Because when I go here, I click sign in with Kicklog, and I know it's going to be a bit confusing because my browser has auto completed the look that admin stuff, but these are basically ignored. You can just let's pretend that's not there, right? This is not important. When you to log in with Kick, sign in with Kicklog, these other parts are being ignored. Click on it. Now we are in Kicklog. If you look at the URL now, slash KC. For our kickoff instance, user was called um, test user and ABC123, I think it was called ABC3. And we log in. So now we are logged in to this as two with the test user. And we have all the same credentials as a test user. Of course, in this one, we are not logged in yet. Again, this has no effect, let's just ignore those parts. But now you understand your kick lock because it's the same browser, same session. Let's click it and log in. No password, no nothing needed. So if you have a user that has multiple instances of DHS2, it's a very nice way of handling it. If they call you and say, oh, I forgot my password, you don't have to go into those two instances. You just go to kick lock and change the password there. 
Pardon? Oh, that's DHS. That's DHS2, yeah. Potentially, potentially we can do something there. Um, but right now it's all about authentication. So basically username and password only. Yeah. But potentially there's something to be done there. There's a much deeper integration and something we have to look into a lot later, but um, potentially, yeah. There is, there is no formula for, uh, for user, user role, but then access all the data. They can visually just contact. Basically, by user. So, sort of like you are defining all your user and everything in DHS, right? And they say, yeah, this particular user can only view the data, cannot change anything. Like, everything is the same. You uh, actually can uh, download the data. And also maybe the, the usefulness is even bigger if you also have other systems like OpenMRS or other systems that support OpenID Connect. So you can have the same username in multiple systems, not only DHS2, but they all link back to the same people. So when they forgot they used to use the same password, they can go there and reset it, and it's reset everywhere automatically. Yeah. That's kind of, that, that's, that's part of the point. Yeah. I think we have that they have DB, which is online system, built by their software. Um, and then, like you also have other systems, it's not the issue. You have other systems, those are not DHS, they have different systems. And then they also have DHS too for aggregate for NCD and all those things. At the password level, the so one person has to log on to this multiple system, the multiple username, password. And then DHS too has also the prescription, right? The password should be one capital, one letter, and one thing. In other systems, it's not like that. Like, that's why I would say it's much better to have people so that like, they, they are helping the end user uh, so they can just remember one password and they can log into all the systems. Okay. Okay. Any other questions before we finish? If, not, if not, there's a tea break happening. Okay, so we'll break and we'll be back at the 11 o'clock for the country presentation. Okay, okay. So thanks so much. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. 